хүний төлөө их хорн чинь юу хийж чадах вэ гэж асуухаасаа өмнө та өөрөө их хорны хүн төлөө юу хийж чадах вэ гэж асуу ян фэжэл сан байцхана хүнд үзэгчтэй өнөөдөр ороо манай де факто нэвтрүүлгийн зочноор германы илчин сайд пиос фишер оролцож байна good evening good evening mr charles sachan пиос фишер 1948 онд аугсбург хот төрсөн их нэр нэг хүүхдтэй 1974 ш 1976 онд эдийн засгийн шинжилгээ ухааны чиглэлээр суралцсан мастер зэрэг хамгаалсан 1979-1982 онд шин дэлхийн хот төх Германы элчин сайд ийм 1985-1988 онд Ватикан төх Германы элчин сайд ийм 1988-1992 онд Лос-Анжелес хот төх Германы консулын газар 1996-2001 онд Гвинея Сьерра Леоне улс төх Германы элчин сайдаар ажиллаж байсан 2004-2007 онд Камбож улс төх Германы элчин сайд 2007 оноос хойш Монгол улс төх Германы элчин сайдаар ажиллаж байна Thank you for coming to my program. Thank you for inviting me. Well, before we go to the deep of our conversation, I will ask you what makes you keeping so strong all the time? What kind of sport do you do? I'm very fond of uh, outdoors, uh, particularly uh, of uh, mountaineering, uh, skiing, but uh, also horse riding. Occasionally uh, I play also tennis uh, and uh, here in Mongolia I made it actually a uh, habit to go every Sunday f- um, hiking in the mountains surrounding Ulaanbaatar and skiing uh, skiing during winter time of course uh, the ski resort uh, is a big asset uh, now to uh, um, Ulaanbaatar but uh, compared to alpine uh, standards uh, the slopes are very modest and uh, so usually i prefer to sk- ski in the alps every sunday i see you on the slope and you are the the best one of the best skiers on this slope how come <laughs> thank you <laughs> <How many> years <laughs> have you been skiing in alps which part Um, normally I ski uh, in Switzerland but I do it also in Germany in Austria I did it in France and in Italy but every year I go to the Engadine uh, in Switzerland and this is the area I know best uh, for skiing and there are famous peaks like Pitzkorvac uh, Pitzlagalp uh, Diavoletza and others uh, where I used to ski do you exercise every day No, I don't. Unfortunately, I I should do it um, because uh, in my age uh, you have to exercise regularly f- to keep fit. Um, so I do a little bit of gymnastics twice uh, a week uh, and every Sunday I go hiking or skiing. So uh, for hiking yes in Mongolia there are which mountains you like the most around Ulaanbaatar? Well, um, of course, the most beautiful uh, mountains are in the Altai uh, mountains and in the Tavanbokt Altai I climbed uh, also Huitun Ul and Malchin Ul uh, and this is certainly the most spectacular uh, mountain site uh, here in uh, Mongolia. Around uh, Ulaanbaatar, uh, I like particularly the mountains in the Terelch uh, because uh, it's a very rocky area and we discovered uh, areas here where i'm sure said very few mongolians uh, except for the herders uh, living in the terelch uh, have gone so accessible. far and uh, also uh, tetsigon uh, many times i think at least two dozen or three dozen times i've been up on tetsigon during winter spring and summer well, uh, over 20 times you were on tetsigon yeah wow impressive yeah. Well, uh, Ambassador, you are a German career diplomat, and uh, out of uh, your list where you have been working, I was so curious to know you were working in Vatican, which mm-hmm. is Holy See, how you call it. Tell us, share us with that, how was it like to work there, and what is your mission there? Uh, the Vatican, of course, is a very special uh, mission. 
And uh, amongst all the embassy, Germany entertains uh, around the world, and we have about uh, 120 embassy embassies. This is the oldest uh, embassy uh, we have. How many hundred years? Uh, it goes back uh, actually uh, to the 17th century that uh, Germany entertains uh, diplomatic relations uh, with the Holy See, and until. Uh, 1933, actually, there were always two German uh, missions to the Holy See. It was uh, Prussia and it was Bavaria who entertained diplomatic relations with the Holy See. And only once um, the new uh, agreement has been signed uh, between uh, the German Empire at the time and uh, the Holy See, uh, we had one mission uh, there. And traditionally, all the ambassadors uh, which were sent uh, from Germany to the Holy See were of high rank. Uh, my ambassador, I was second secretary at our embassy mm -hmm. uh, at the time, and my ambassador uh, was the former foreign secretary in our ministry, and he was ambassador in Washington before he became ambassador uh, to the Holy See. To Germany get together where you were. In uh, 1989, when the wall came down, I was in Los Angeles, in California, and I still uh, remember we were glued, actually, uh, to the t television screen. And even though uh, the American uh, media normally do not report a lot about foreign policy f uh, affairs, yes. but if there is something happening in the world uh, of major importance, then all the power and all the focus of the American uh, media is on this. And I remember they sent uh, their best correspondents uh, to Berlin to report uh, directly uh, from the Berlin uh, Wall. And there were Peter Jennings and many other f famous anchormen. Of Personally, how you were taking it? Uh, we were, of course, uh, very moved uh, by this uh, moment because nobody in Germany expected that this uh, would happen. Which year there was, a, well, first the uh, President Kennedy in 61, I believe, and then later on uh, President Reagan was speaking beyond the wall towards Russia. Yeah, his words actually, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down uh, the wall. Actually, they were in the ears of uh, all the Germans. And that this became uh, true so soon uh, after, uh, really nobody expected. Uh, um, you were um, ambassador to Cambodia before coming to Mongolia. Why Mongolia? Um, it's a choice, right? You, you guys, you as ambassador. We have a system uh, where you can apply for certain postings uh, which will become uh, available because we have a rotation period of three years. So every three years, uh, an ambassador has to move uh, to another assignment. And I applied for about uh, eight or nine different uh, postings in Asia, because Asia is uh, the region of preference uh, for me, and particularly all the countries uh, around China, because the uh, economic and political rise of China is to me one of the most fascinating um, uh, political uh, phenomena in, in diplomacy. And uh, particularly in the countries uh, around uh, China, you can observe uh, actually the consequences of uh, these changes in uh, China. Indeed. So Mongolia was one of the choices, uh, and the personnel division decided uh, to send me to Mongolia. I still remember it was on a Friday afternoon uh, that uh, I uh, cleared my desk uh, in Phnom Penh in Cambodia. And um, on this Monday morning after, I started uh, my work here in Ulaanbaatar. There was nothing in between, just the weekend. Yeah. Whoa. And Cambodia, as you know, is a tropical country, and uh, Ulaanbaatar is known to be the coldest capital of the world. So it was quite a change, <laughs> yeah. But luckily, it was during summertime. What kind of requirements for German diplomats are in terms of language? How many, which languages you should, must speak? 
So a um, compulsory requirement uh, is a sufficient command of English and French. Uh, if you know other languages, it's an asset, uh, but uh, it's not uh, a requirement. Uh, during uh, my diplomatic uh, career, uh, I first learned uh, Hindi, uh, the, and my first posting uh, was India. Uh, India. Uh, but um, unfortunately, since then, uh, I didn't have any opportunity to use my Hindi, so I could still uh, read it uh, to some extent, uh, but I couldn't speak it anymore. And later on, when I was posted to the Holy See in Rome, uh, I learned, of course, Italian. Italian. Well, just uh, every time when I meet uh, German diplomats, they speak this Bath language. Perfect. Of and with along with your languages, the three most spoken language in Europe and in the world, in fact. Well, uh, so you are in Mongolia. Uh, how do you find the relationship between uh, Mongolia, Germany, today <coughs> at the moment? It's a moment. I think uh, these relations are at a very crucial uh, point. Um, of course, we have excellent political relations uh, with Mongolia, but this was not reflected so far in the economic uh, field because uh, the trade figures um, uh, are uh, showing that uh, the trade volume of um, Germany and Mongolia is just on the order of 100 million euro, which would be about 140 million US dollars. And this is actually peanuts um, for uh, Germany, which is the uh, wise world export uh, champion. Uh, we are the biggest export nation after uh, China. And Mongolia is one of the 10 resource richest countries uh, of the world. So the present trade volume is far below the potential of our two countries. Right now, this could change if actually uh, this German mining consortium, which is um, on the short list uh, for um, uh, Tavantolgoi for East Zank, uh, would get the contract. Uh, I am sure uh, that this would give a whole new dimension uh, talk to about German BBM? Mongolian. It's BBM, yeah. A consortium, mm -hmm. who is there inside? Uh, in this uh, consortium, so far it's a loose grouping of companies, but uh, if they get the contract, uh, they would, of course, formalize uh, their uh, cooperation. There is RWE, which is one of the biggest power producers in Germany, and RWE is also one of the biggest uh, lignite uh, miners in Germany. RWE, for example, is mining every year some 100 million tons of brown coal of lignite. This is, uh, at the moment, five times as much uh, as the whole of Mongolia yes, um, export, yes. is uh, uh, producing and uh, exporting. I think Mongolia is exporting its, or was exporting in 2010 some 16 million yes, uh, tons and plus 5 million tons for uh, domestic consumption. And they produce where, in Germany or all and around the world? And they produce... In Germany, in Germany, oh. all of their uh, open pit mines are in Germany. Well, so you have uh, so much brown coal? Uh, yeah, we are uh, very rich in brown coal, uh, but this is actually one of the very few natural resources uh, we have in Germany. Otherwise, uh, the German economy uh, depends more actually uh, on its human capital than on natural uh, resources. Technology. And the German industry is known for uh, actually its expertise in all areas of technology. Well, we wish this, uh, at which level uh, do things go now? Is it, uh, well, is it tender, final tender for operation or production or which part of this big project? Uh, this is actually the tender for contract mining uh, uh -huh. at the eastern part uh, of um, Tavantolgoi, but um, I think uh, this is up uh, to those uh, who compare the bids now to decide uh, which company is best. In case if they will win, job. they will dig, produce, take it out, wash probably, then send it or it will be further processing? Um, 
Of course, the plan is uh, in the long run uh, to bring in all the downstream activities uh, of coal uh, processing, and uh, this is also the declared objective of the Mongolian government, not to export uh, coal as raw coal, but... Uh, to What's happening uh, now? create added value inside uh, <laughs> the borders of Mongolia to create jobs uh, here and to export uh, actually uh, these products like coking coal uh, or produce electricity from coal, export the electricity, coal liquefaction, coal go gasification, all yes. these uh, are options uh, downstream. And there is also a German, I think, uh, involvement in uh, laying the railroads from Chinese border to particular uh, mining sites? Um, there was some German uh, involvement um, until actually uh, the new railway strategy has been adopted, which is uh, based uh, on the principle uh, to expand the Mongolian railway network exclusively in wide gauge technology. So some of these private projects to build direct uh, rail uh, connections uh, from some of the deposits um, in the South Gobi to the Chinese uh, border have been put on ice. Uh, oh, was it? And we still uh, expect now they will, they will put uh, a railroad until this main road they will make with a Russian uh, standard. I think this uh, railway strategy, uh, which was adopted uh, by the Mongolian government and the uh, Ichural, uh, the Mongolian parliament, uh, has two clear priorities. First, everything should be done in wide gauge technology. And secondly, priority should be given uh, to west-east connection with the objective actually to create a second exit uh, for Mongolian commodities, particularly coal, through the East Russian ports uh, towards uh, Japan and Korea. And geopolitically, economically, uh, this uh, makes sense, uh, actually. The question is just whether the transportation over such a long distance uh, will not be too uh, expensive. But this has to be sorted out. And, oh. uh, but in principle, I think Mongolia should not be dependent on one uh, country only if it comes to uh, its exports. Well, still, you know, in public, we thought this railroad will be done by a uh, narrow Chinese uh, railway to all the way to Tawan Talgai from south. Mm. And you're saying that it is stopped or frozen? It's at least put on ice. I think sooner or later uh, this project will come up again and uh, it will be, so to say, not the first but the second priority. So. Okay. Uh, well, what are other field sectors potential? that to grow economic relations between two countries? Um, to Deutsche Bank, as you know, has been uh, selected uh, as global coordinator together with uh, Goldman Sachs yes. uh, for the IPO of Ernest Tavan Tolgoy. And uh, this is a uh, major... Have um, they started uh, the war? Uh, not yet. Uh, actually, the um, uh, contract still has to be uh, formalized. The uh -huh. decision as such has been taken, but the contract still has to be formalized. And then they'll take up their work. And there is a very ambitious uh, time schedule. I understand that Great. the IPO should be done in the first quarter so of 2012. With, uh, BBM and uh, Deutsche Bank coming to Mongolia, they will be changing this on schedule you are describing. This was exactly what I wanted to say. If these two uh, things are going to happen, this will change dramatically German-Mongolian uh, economic relations. Okay. Uh, now let's talk about the people's, the ordinary people's yeah. relations. And uh, we, we also say in Mongolia that we have so many per capita German-speaking people probably comparable to any other Asian countries. Um, how do you see that, having Mongolians speaking German and Mongolians living in Germany? I think um, we have a very special relationship. And uh, 
uh, a long history and tradition of German-Mongolian uh, relations. Already th in the 20s of the last century, when the first Mongolian students um, who were sent abroad for their studies went to Germany. One of the returnees uh, was a later uh, national p poet of Mongolia, Natsak Dorch. Uh, he was one of those students uh, who were sent uh, to Germany. Then during the communist period, um, relations with Germany became somewhat uh, difficult. Uh, it was in 1950 that the GDR established uh, diplomatic relations with uh, the People's Republic of Mongolia at the time, and 74 uh, the Federal Republic of Germany. And during that time, many uh, Mongolian students have been sent for their training, for their studies uh, to East Germany in Do particular. You have statistics? Um, unfortunately, not. Uh, <laughs> we only know uh, that approximately uh, 30,000 uh, Mongolians speak German and have been trained in uh, Several Germany. generations. And this means that more, of, more than 1% of the Mongolian population speaks uh, German. This is a situation we have in no other Asian country. And uh, do you have a particular attention to this? Uh, we try, of course, uh, to develop uh, this uh, human capital and this uh, potential. Uh, we are offering uh, German language courses through the Goethe Institute uh, here in Ulaanbaatar. Uh, we have four lecturers from the German Academic Exchange Service at various Mongolian universities. And we are working uh, also with some of the schools, uh, for example, uh, the uh, School 38, which has been renamed into Alexander von Humboldt Schule. Mm. Uh, one of uh, the uh, schools which offer German as uh, first foreign language uh, from the first until the last class, wow. as does the Goethe School, which is a private school also here in Ulaanbaatar. There is a, also there is certain people, two people, bridges, organizations in between two countries, those in Mongolia. Uh, what kind of uh, good organizations? Uh, there are, are a number of organizations and uh, they help, for example, returnees, Mongolians uh, who completed their studies uh, in Germany uh, to reintegrate into the Mongolian society and they help actually them uh, finding jobs uh, in companies in uh, government agencies and uh, there are many p examples actually of Mongolian alumni which are now in top positions uh, in Mongolia. The Minister of Defense, uh, he is fluent in uh, German. Yes. Uh, he has been... Uh, he was my guest here. Ah, he was your <laughs> guest as well. Uh, he has been uh, nominated uh, by the Prime Minister just 10 days ago as coordinator for German-Mongolian uh, affairs. But we have also, uh, for example, Mr. Terbish Takwa, a member of parliament, who, who is also the chairman of the uh, uh, Mongolian-German Parliamentary Friendship Group, and many others uh, in all uh, walks uh, of life. We even have uh, Mongolian artists uh, who became very successful in Germany. Uh, Gal Sanchinak, uh, I would like to name. Yes. Uh, uh, he actually won many literary prizes uh, in Germany. He writes uh, and uh, he writes also his poems in German language. Uh, he's so proficient uh, in the German language uh, that he has a better command uh, over this language than many Germans. Wonderful. Uh, I think it's for many years yeah. and this uh, route goes very deep and I'm so uh, thankful for that because we are connected for almost there will be soon hundred years of this relations to, from the first time <coughs> we sent students to Germany. Uh, indeed, uh, of course one could trace uh, German uh, Mongolia history even further back. Uh, 1241 uh, there was this uh, famous battle uh, at Lignitz mm -hmm. uh, which is now Poland uh, yeah. which at the time uh, was uh, Germany yeah. and it was a uh, battle between the Mongolian uh, army and a German Polish uh, army 
And since then, uh, we have been in direct contact uh, with the uh, Mongolian Empire, but w one could even trace it back further uh, to the Hunitic times. Uh, Uh, because in the German national uh, epos, uh, in the Nibelungen uh, saga, there appears a Hunitic uh, king by the name of Attila. Uh -huh. And, um, of course, uh, Attila can be traced back uh, also to the Huns uh, here in uh, Mongolia. So I think it's a very long history, even so, of course, in Hunitic times... Uh, It's very difficult to differentiate what is myth, uh, what is legend, and uh, what are historic facts. Yeah, it's uh, such a great thing. Uh, and now we have also many Germans working in Mongolia as well. Um, we have a small, uh, I would say, uh, German community Community. working uh, here. It's mainly uh, experts uh, working uh, for the GIZ, uh, uh -huh. the um, German Agency for Technical uh, Cooperation. Uh -huh. It was um, GTZ, now actually Renamed. they merged with the German Development Service and with INVENT, and now they call themselves GIZ. Will it uh, increase their program? Or, or the no, size of um, program or I think it's just a, a merger of three uh, different organizations under one uh, per roof, so it will not increase uh, the volume. But if you we are talking about the volume, uh, Germany used to be uh, number two as development partner after Japan for Mongolia. For Mongolia, for years. Maybe now with the Millennium Challenge Compact, uh, uh -huh. we have been overtaken. Um, by the United States um, as development partner. Uh, Ambassador, uh, there is a question I cannot but ask you about uh, Mr. Hort, <laughs> who, who is uh, arrested in uh, England, and I understand it is <coughs> by the request of German government. Tell us, what is this about? It's not by request of the German government, it's by request uh, actually of the German prosecutor's uh, office. Which is separate and than government. Which is completely separate. And uh, there have been so many wrong and false, even absurd articles uh, in the Mongolian press, which to my opinion reveal also a lack uh, of the understanding of basic concepts of uh, democracy. And uh, in any democracy, there should be a clear division actually between the judiciary the executive, which is the government, and uh, the legislative, which is the parliament, which means that the government, the executive, does not give instructions uh, to the judiciary, and uh, that's why we also don't comment normally the judicial affairs, because this is the exclusive Uh, domain and competency of the German uh, courts, and we regard this as a legal case, not as a political case. And uh, do you think they will now deport him from UK to Germany? I am uh, not a prophet. This <laughs> is completely up to Separate. the uh, British uh, courts uh, how they are going to decide about this uh, case. Okay. Um, let's back to uh, the economic uh, cooperation Uh, a couple months ago, there was a wonderful, for Mongolian public, uh, information about taking German European standard to Mongolia. <coughs> Tell us about that, please. Um, in the last year, actually, we had ne negotiations between um, the European Union and Mongolia on the signing of a partnership and cooperation agreement. Uh, this uh, partnership and cooperation agreement has now been initialed and uh, will be signed most probably uh, very soon. And one, actually, uh, of the uh, articles of this agreement uh, provides uh, for a uh, closer cooperation between the European Union and Mongolia on the uh, introduction of European norms and standards uh, here in Mongolia. And uh, I think uh, particularly with the East European countries who became members of the European uh, Union, uh, we have experiences 
how to switch from the old standards of the Comicon to the new standards uh, of the European Union. And these experiences could be applied uh, to the Mongolian uh, context. We are talking about technical standards, environmental standards, social and labor standards and standards um, uh, also insofar as governance uh, is concerned. How far things go now so far? So f um, we already started uh, in this area through our German GIZ uh, and a team of Mongolian experts uh, has been uh, jointly uh, invited by Germany and the Czech Republic uh, to visit the Czech Republic. Uh, this uh, Mongolian delegation uh, was led by f First Deputy Prime Minister Altan Khuyag. And this was a first beginning actually to study the European uh, norms and standards and to bring them to Mongolia. There is a program also which will be financed uh, by the EU Commission with some seven, eight million of, uh, euro, uh, which will help actually to bring these standards to Mongolia. Well, hopefully it will happen fast, soon, and yeah. we will uh, see the result. Yeah, yeah, of course, uh, we are under enormous uh, time pressure because these standards are needed in every way and uh, our experts really are on, uh, under enormous pressure to uh, produce results. Well, this, uh, the way how our roads are made, how our um, people, uh, in particular from the city, uh, mismanaging their roads, the uh, planning of the city, the way how we construct buildings on the middle of the road, all this together requires even a serious standard and very soon. Uh, building standards <laughs> is uh, also very important, uh, no doubt. Uh, to a limited extent, uh, we try to introduce uh, particularly standards for energy in efficient construction for houses with better insulation so that less energy is wasted uh, and consumed uh, here in Ulaanbaatar because indirectly this will be also a contribution to the reduction of the air pollution here That's in Ulaanbaatar. That's what the most need. <coughs> Do you hear anything about the power station number five instead of the power station number <coughs> three? If there is any German technology as expert with connection? So far, um, uh, only uh, what I know is that uh, the Asian uh, Development Bank is preparing a feasibility study uh -huh. on the location, on the size uh, and the outlay of this power plant number five. As soon as this is done, I think a tender will be prepared, hopefully an international tender. And then automatically German companies uh, will uh, certainly uh, be in the rain actually mm -hmm. for uh, this tender. A uh, question is uh, <coughs> now as a person who is living in Ulaanbaatar Lambata city, how do you deal with the winter air in the city? Yeah, this is uh, really the biggest uh, challenge how to cope uh, with uh, the air pollution uh, here in uh, Ulaanbaatar. And this is, uh, it's not so cold, it's uh, the foul air actually, which is a major pr problem. And um, I think it's very urgent that uh, the municipality of Ulaanbaatar, uh, the government and all agencies uh, which are responsible, undertake something to reduce the air pollution because this is a problem also for public health uh, here in Ulaanbaatar. And I've just uh, read a World Bank uh, study according uh, to which Actually, the health cost makes up 8% of the gross national product wow. uh, of Mongolia at the moment because uh, respiratory uh, diseases, uh, particularly amongst uh, the younger uh, generation, uh, teens and uh, children, is extremely high. Uh, so the health cost uh, is enormous and uh, we are talking about the future of, uh, of Mongolia, future generations. Uh, I think uh, definitely something should be done against the air pollution. Unfortunately, we Mongolians and in particular Mongolian politicians understand the urgency when the winter comes. <laughs> When the yeah. spring comes, we forget it. Yeah. So probably it is another circle. This is very human. Yeah. <laughs> human, okay. Thank you. <laughs> very human, Ambassador.
Thank you very much for coming to Thank my program. Thank you very much for inviting me. And I hope Mongolians now have more, again, more updated from your first hand from German ambassador. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.